Good evening. You're watching CU at USC. I'm your host, Daniel DeMasso, and tonight we have with us USC professor Jacob Saul. Stay tuned. Welcome back to see you at USC. Again, we have Jacob Saul joining us. Thank you for joining us. Thank Jacob, you. yes, yeah, thanks, <laughs> we're thanks. live now, we're running. Yeah, all right, great. Um, great, so um, you're a man of uh, some, some big accomplishments, but um, you have a new book that came out in the last uh, year and a half, two years, correct? Couple years, yeah. Um, can you just kind of give me the rundown of what that's kind of about, what, what you've been doing to, to tour it, to show it off? Yeah, no, I wrote this book. It was a weird book about how, um, states basically function with accounting, which sounds super nerdy and boring. <laughs> but what I was, I was in the archives and I was looking at how these giant monarchies invented mm -hmm. states. Okay. We, everyone says they want to get rid of states, but we had to build them. It was like a really tough, mm -hmm. big job. In America and Europe and all right. over the world, states were built. And so I went into the archives to like look for the DNA of okay. these states. And I found all this material about accounting. Mm -hmm. I was like, no one has ever discussed this. Yeah. So I wrote this book showing how states that had clear, good financial records really did better than other states. Yeah. And that you could see when they started messing up those financial records, it was a predictor for failure. Mm. Um, and so I wrote this book. It was a very nerdy book in many ways, although I thought it was exciting. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, it came out right as the Greek and Eurozone debt crisis was really sparking. Right. And so suddenly I got swept from the 16th and 17th centuries right, right into that, those current events. And that was kind of a wild experience. Yeah, sort of the common trope of uh, those who fail to recognize patterns in history are, are doomed to repeat them, right? That one, absolutely. Many of them, actually, I don't totally agree, but that okay. one is a predictor. It's even a predictor here in the United yeah. States. We have terrible uh, basic financial accounting within the federal government. Mm -hmm. Now, um, <clears throat> you are a professor of history, but uh, did you have a uh, background in finance or accounting or anything like that before you started doing this research? No. Uh, in fact, I didn't. Okay. And a lot of people laugh at me for doing this because <laughs> they know me well. Uh, and they know, for example, that I don't ever account for wine sp expenditures. I, I consider that a religious necessity to have massive amounts of good French wine. Mm -hmm. So they laughed at me for this. But no, the point was I went into the archives and I saw it. And a historian's kind of like a gold prospector. Right. You head into the archives, or like an archaeologist, and you're yeah. digging, and you know, it's like a Raiders of the Lost Ark, and a big wall falls down, and you've discovered the tomb. Right. That's what happened to me. There was just this massive load of materials that no one had ever discussed, because they didn't think they were, the material was interesting, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be incredibly fruitful. Now, uh, was there something specific you were looking for when you first went uh, into researching these records and looking yeah. for something specific? What, uh, that's a great question. What was the original mission? The original mission was to study Louis XIV's minister Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Okay. Louis XIV built Versailles. Actually, Colbert built it for him. He's considered one of the big, most important state builders in history. Um, his, there's a freeze of him in the Senate of the United States as one of the great lawgivers. And I was doing a project to understand how he created an internal information system in the state, making it into like a sort of a giant computer encyclopedia. Okay. And while I was in there, mm -hmm. you know, one of the walls fell down and I found the, the secret right. tomb and it was filled with all this accounting material. He was an accountant and that's how he built the state and built his information system. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I need to understand this. And that's what I did. Yeah, so. sort of taking note of what you have, always a, a, a good idea to start, good place to start off. Um, so I'm curious, uh, because you're, I, was, I was reading your, your biography, your father was a molecular geneticist, your mother was a dance choreographer. How did you get an interest in history? Uh, um, I mean, you know, so I was always a historian. I always knew, mm -hmm. you know, I came out young. And um, I mean, I was fed this, my family's from Europe, and I was yeah. fed this stuff at an early age, and it just took, I mean, you know, when I was, 10 my grandfather was feeding me history books right um so i i just 
you know, rare history books, old history books. Was, was it something like uh, you got to know where you ca you came from? You got to learn about the family. Read this. You or know, was I, it your own kind of interest? Was it sort of pushed towards you? Well, or? My, my grandmother's from a really old family, and she was always pushing this stuff. But, you, but there's no one else in my family who's that in, who does this. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's the reason. Um, when I teach history classes, I was teaching a class today, and there's one kid in the class who's a biologist, and he wrote a phenomenal research paper right. about Machiavelli and this guy named Castiglione. Mm -hmm. and, he's a, and I told him that he's a natural. There's some kids in the class who are actually history majors who yeah. weren't necessarily... Like him, he's just a natural. Some people have the natural instinct for it. Everything I see, I see in historical perspective, and I always have. I see a building, I see a place, I think about it in yeah. historical perspective. Uh, what are some of those like building blocks you were looking for, or what are some of those defining features that happen in, in this kid's essay um, that oh. signaled to you, or flagged to you that this kid... Um, yeah, he, is, he could spin through the texts, mm -hmm. weave them together analytically, right. make an argument, and walk right through the text almost naturally to prove his point. Right. And he felt completely comfortable in those texts. And he said, I've never done this before. And I said, you're a natural. And, and, that, and I said, there are people like this who think historically. If right. I teach a lecture course with 80 kids, there'll be four who can fill in more detail than I can. They're naturally yeah, you know, set for it. And the other kids want to kill them, obviously. They're like, this isn't fair. <laughs> but some people, you know, there are people, when people are hardwired to be mathematicians, we don't think about it. Mm -hmm. But some people are actually hardwired to be historians. Mm -hmm. So well, um, so growing up, were there other pursuits that you were involved with? Were you a sports guy? Um, did you cook? Did you do theater? Um, oh, yeah. What was sort of on the side? Or was it you came home every day and, and kind of read and I mean, wrote? No, I was, um, well, I was a Boy Scout. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> um, Me too, pack 158. <laughs> I, was, I was a Boy Scout, so I like, you know, heading out into the wilderness with my knives and all that kind of stuff. Um, I collected comic books, mm. Superman, old Superman comic books. I like that. I have, um, a, st I have a stack in my basement right yeah, now. Yeah, all right, good fan. for you. Um, I got close to some really old ones, actually. I yeah. still have that collection. Um, yeah, I was always into cooking, but, you know, honestly, I was really into history. I grew up. Um, mostly in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but also some other places. And it was an old place, and I yeah. loved to walk the streets um, mm. and look at old buildings and dodge into bookstores. That Back then, Cambridge, Massachusetts was filled yeah. with old bookstores, and you could go in and out of... Harvard, by the way, didn't lock its doors back then. Really? So you could go at night into the basements. The buildings were all open in the 70s. Yeah. The whole place was open. Yeah, I, I heard somebody um, tell a story about how they uh, sort of got a Harvard education just kind of by walking in and sitting down, uh, never paying tuition just because no one was really checking. That's, um, that was definitely possible when yeah. I was a kid. I mean, yeah. those of us who grew up there still feel like we own the place because you just, you know, in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. you go to the Science Center. You could go there, underground tunnels at Harvard, everything. So. Mm. Um, so uh, what sort of uh, w what's your process when you're sitting down to write to write a book mm -hmm. when you found the premise you've done some of the research and something grabs you huh. is it an everyday sit down at the desk and, and start typing away or, or do you have a sort of routine that you fall into I mean uh, honestly it's a tough process mm -hmm. what you come up with kind of a vague idea and you spend a lot of time researching it and until you put the whole book together it's terrifying I'm in that yeah. moment right now where the book this new book that I'm doing is not fully gelled. Okay. And so I don't sleep well. Um, I, you know, I'm nervous. It's really hard. And when the book takes um, and you start writing, you've put everything together, it kind of scrolls down in your head. That is really great. That's the best mm -hmm. part. Well, the best part is discovering something amazing. Right. Then the, the other best part is when it scrolls down in your head, but then you have to edit it and clean it up and do the footnotes, and that's kind of a nightmare. Mm. So it's a really tough process. I have to say, I take my hat off to those who have written in the business many, many great yeah. books. There are a few people who have the force that people have no idea how hard it is. And yeah. It's physically tough to write these books. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, um, do you set out to write books or do you set out uh, simply to learn and, and to gather information and something strikes you as this needs to be written down, nobody's written about this? I mean, both. Okay. So you get the idea, but if you're a writer, you know, actually I have the same, when I used to collect comics, mm -hmm. I would obsessively get each number, you know, put yeah, them, yeah. stack them up, and yeah. every night I'd go through them and yeah. kind of 
obsessively. Did you have the, the little um, bags? Yeah, the, yeah, the sleeves. Yeah, sleeves, yeah. yeah and then put them in those cardboard boxes. Mm -hmm. And I'd count through and, and sort of go over it. Writing's the same way. Every day you count how many pages you've done. Yeah. Um, so uh, it seems like a very anxious process. Um, it's an anxious process. And at the end, when you're done, and for example, if the book, if you're happy with the book and it goes well, there's this brief year and a half of absolute bliss mm -hmm. and just sort of, well, you doubt yourself at the end. You think it's a lousy book. But if people like it, it's really wonderful to have worked so hard mm -hmm. on something and get right. people all around the world liking something you've worked in the dark on for years, right? right. That's really cool. It's not something you do f in six months, something you do in five years. Uh, and then like a year and a half later, you start feeling that your life is pointless and <laughs> your brain sort of empties out. Yeah, you need a new project. You need a new project and that's not so easy. Um, yeah. It's an intense experience. So right? in that sort of year and a half after the book comes out and the light's on you, how do you fill that time? Well, first of all, think about this. Think about especially before you become more known. I mm. mean, I do the lecture <clears throat> circuit. I'm out in the world right. a lot now. But before, you'd spend five years in libraries truly by yourself. Yeah. An incredibly lonely process. I mean, sometimes months and months just working alone mm. on this project. And then suddenly, the coin flips, and you're out in the world giving speeches and lectures right. in front of hundreds of people all the time. It's a really <coughs> weird business. I mean, yeah. I, that's the my most recent discovery. <laughs> I'm like, this is like takes a really. I'm like a weird. <coughs> like, I'm a hermit, and mm -hmm. then you have to be the extrovert. It's right. just really weird. It's weird. Yeah. When you started writing your first book, um, was the whole lecture circuit having a, a, a spotlight on you? Was that anywhere in your mind? No, or no, no. Now is it something you look forward to, or is it something you sort of dread? Do you define yourself as more introvert or, oh, that's or really extrovert? Interesting. I mean, the lecture circuit can be really exciting and fun. Right. It can be terrifying. It's exhausting. I mean, mm -hmm. you go in front of a big crowd and you give a big speech and they have to like it. You have to yeah. knock the, the ball out of the park. If if people have paid you to come to, it's e the pressure is even more. Yeah. Or if there are a lot of students or young people or experts in the crowd and they have great expectations, mm -hmm. I mean, it's terrifying. It's great when you've done it. Yeah. But it's also a giant adrenaline rush. So you're yeah. freaked out beforehand. You do it. You get the adrenaline rush. Then you're flying home, and you're like, what's the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. And that's when you have to head back to the archives. Um, when you were coming to as a writer and a, and a historian, did you did you always think you were going to be successful? Or was there oh. doubt? Or oh, yeah. yeah. Doubt all the time. What was that sort of like internal monologue um, <clears throat> going through your head as you were trying to find a, uh, cement yourself? Okay, that's, I mean, that's like a real question <laughs> because no, that's that, it, the internal dialogue is actually the method. Mm. You say to yourself, I'm not, I, I want to do this. I want to achieve this. I believe mm. in it, all right? So how do I do it? I don't think I'm very good. So essentially what I need to do is look at the people who are really good and mm -hmm. look at what they've done and try and live up to that model. All these different right. people. Right. And so um, it's not clear that I have reached the point that I want to reach of the people I admire. But that's the process. Um, Wonderful. So um, Great. We have to go to commercial break. Um, there will be more See You at USC after these commercials. Stay tuned. Welcome back to see you at USC. Again, we're with USC professor Jacob Saul. Um, so right before the break, we were talking about um, your work process and living up to these heroes. Who are uh, your idols? Who do you idolize? Um, well, there are a lot of them, so mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to name actual names okay. because I'll leave people out, but they're truly great historians. Um, I went into history because of a whole bunch of French historians. There was a time in France when Mm. They had these historians who were incredible. I mean, they still have wonderful yeah. historians, but these giants who wrote these books that were, I'm still using in my courses today that are inspiring, great books. And luckily, I got to work um, in France, in Britain, and in America with a lot of my heroes. Mm -hmm. They are really grand scholars. Yeah, the, uh, contemporary yeah. writers and scholars? Uh, well, I mean, they're alive today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so they're, um, and I worked with them, and that was the great honor. But to live up to them, I doubt it. Mm. And that's something <laughs> you have to live with every day. That's tough. Right. Um, so you've done work uh, outside of your novels. You've written for uh, New York Times. There's the New Yorker, um, several other columns and posts. 
Uh, how do those opportunities, do those come after the first book and after you sort of had a name in, in the world of history? Actually, I got a Guggenheim and I had mm -hmm. an idea and I don't remember how it happened. I wrote the Times for my first op-ed wow. and I pitched it to them. I said, I just got a Guggenheim and I have an idea and they said, great, let's do it. And that was in really a crazy experience. <laughs> I don't think it was a great op-ed and not that many people okay. read it because I've had others that have gone viral and been shared you know, thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of times around the world. But we worked on it. The editor and I worked on it for th like three weeks all the time. Yeah. And it was just this little 700 word piece. And when it was done, it was published and that was great. And then he left. I never got to meet the guy yeah. again. I was like, no, no, don't go. Um, but it was a, that was a crazy experience. Yeah. But I pushed that one. And then um, I kind of got became friends with people in the Times op-ed mm -hmm. room and I know them. I'm supposed to be doing a piece for them now and I'm not um, <laughs> because it's hard. Those are hard yeah. pieces and sometimes they fail. You can write five. I mean, if you write for the Times, they mm -hmm. know you. It's very hard to get a piece in the Times, even if they want one from you. Right. You can still write five or six and they won't take them. Yeah. So you've got to be really ready and invested in it emotionally. What was uh, the topic of that first op-ed that you wrote? That one was about the history of accounting and why okay. people mess it up. So was that around the time that you started doing research for yeah. this newest book? Yeah, for this latest book, that's mm -hmm. when I started doing it. And um, I just discovered that people compulsively don't like to look at financial numbers. Right. And so it's not a matter of them being bad or good at it, that they actually compulsively don't want to deal with it. And you can have a culture, there are actual cultures that are better at facing numbers. Mm. Um, I don't think ours is very good at it. Uh, even though we're a hyper-financial society, people don't like to look at basic accounting numbers. They don't even know what that is, and they think it's too nerdy, and they make jokes about it. And we saw what happened <laughs> at the Academy Awards. That was a disaster <laughs> for the accountants. Yeah. They deserved it. But, um, uh, yeah, the writing for the New York Times is wild and crazy, and right. uh, that's been a huge honor. And, by the way, all, this, all these people smashing the press, they're literally, they just don't know what they're talking about. These yeah. guys check every fact. Writing an article for them is so hard. They go through every line. Right. They find three sources. I mean, the standards are really high. You don't have to like what they say, but you have to give them professional respect. It's just, if you don't, you are not living in reality. Right. Because I have to deal with these guys. It's hard. Yeah. Um, with so much on your plate um, day to day, are, are there things that you do to sort of optimize your time throughout the day? Is there a way that you break things down? Do you have a, a tight schedule? Or are you a kind of guy that just rolls out of bed when you can and, and kind of figures it out? Or do you, I mean, do you make a list? Do you prioritize? I, I, you? Yeah, I said make lists, but I'll tell you, I mean, the problem with writing and the problem with this process is mm -hmm. you've got to wait for a tap. It's like waiting for rain. Yeah. Like to shoot a movie, they have to wait for the, in the old days, they have to wait for it to right. rain. I mean, I sometimes will read and read and do stuff until the, 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 the words start scrolling in my head, mm -hmm. until it clicks. And I'll know when that happens. Like It'll happen usually while I'm taking a break and it'll just start scrolling down. I'll go, oh right. God, it's happening. Yeah. Like I've done it. But, you know, I mean, no, I mean, I don't have a typical day because some days are writing days, teaching days. I was supposed to fly to Stanford tomorrow to teach a class. Mm. I'll fly. I was just in Naples giving a paper last week in Italy. Yeah. Um, no, it's crazy. It's and yeah. the, my new life. I was just a nerd before, <laughs> and actually that was kind of tough, but it was really predictable. Yeah. The new life is exciting. I'm grateful. I don't necessarily want it to end, but it's really intense. And there's never a minute off. There are no weekends. You work week weekend nights if you mm -hmm. have to. There's never a second when you're off. Um, what drives you? <laughs> hey, let's not get personal here. Um, yeah. Ah, boy. I mean. First, obviously, like self-loathing. I mean, I have to admit really? that, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's a big, um, <laughs> big strong force. I mean, yeah. I'll be honest about it. I think a lot of driven people loathe themselves, and they don't always yeah. admit it. Um, the other thing is, I part of that is also existential. I want to do something that I believe in that matters. Mm -hmm. um, and then, since history for me is something I deeply believe in, and it's a form of self-expression. If I'm not doing history, I feel like I'm not alive, basically. Yeah. And you know, per artists will tell you this. Yeah. Nerds don't usually say this, but I, I feel that way. So I'm driven by the need to do it. Like I have to do this, and then I guess I need to know that, you know, something to counter the self-loathing to achieve something that makes me feel good. Right. So it's it's a yeah. mixed. It's a the it's a really weird ego process. You have to think you're the best and think you're the worst all at the same time. Yeah. 
and balance that yeah. out. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's the. Oh, it sounds like you're you're doing a very a pretty good job of doing that. But um, I want to talk a little bit about your work. Um, recently, some foreign governments have asked you to come over um, and sort of consult with them, uh, specifically Greece and their financial uh, hardships right now. Can you sort of describe uh, your involvement over there? I mean, I work with certain people in the government and certain people involved in the Greek debt mm -hmm. to talk to um, political uh, and policy people about history, which is a great honor to actually do research in the archives and then go into these crisis rooms and literally put the history on the table. The sad thing is, is there are not that many historians doing it. Yeah. I think it's absolutely essential with almost any problem to put it into historical perspective. First of all, you learn, boy, you know, if we're not, for example, keeping good account books in Greece, we're never gonna pull out of this crisis. Yeah. No matter how much we try, if you don't actually have the tools, we won't do it. And I and, and a team of other uh, reform-minded people are still trying to work to get um, the Greek government to do this. I've heard rumors that recently they have, but it's been a hard process. Um, I was recently in Portugal where they've been making yeah. amazing reforms and, and met the Minister of Finance and met a lot of people in the budget office. And that was the first time that I really felt great because not only had they all read the work, but they mm -hmm. wanted me to come to make the point to push the reforms and the reforms have moved forward and I felt finally some good had come of this because yeah. it's not, you don't go there to celebrate yourself. You go there, well, you want to have fun mm -hmm. and you want to talk about something interesting, but you want something to good, good to come of all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, is there somewhere in the world that you wish would call on you to, to come help out? Is there, is there some place that you really want to be in, uh, a, par a part of? Well, I mean, there are lots of places I'd like to hang out and the places that I get to work in. I'm very lucky because yeah. I get to work in Italy and Portugal and France and England and Holland. I mean, it's just the greatest. And I was just recently in Singapore, which blew me away. Uh, the problem is, is that the United States has some of the worst um, governmental financial accounting in the world. Yeah. And la I mean, it's kind of a sick joke. There has been no interest from the government there. I mean, I've met government officials in Britain, which has some of the best. I deal with major officials from um, places like New Zealand who have the finest standards in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I go into the crisis zones in Europe that have these issues, but the, in the United States, listen, there are people, the former Comptroller General of the United States, uh, David Walker, has been uh, trying for years to get the, the country to use better uh, accounting methods, i.e. we don't have any clue how much money, assets, debt, things like the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. no small thing, like trillion dollar entity or more, yeah. we have no accounting for. And he has not been successful. I have not been, I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. him and I haven't been successful. That's a disappointment and it's a little scary and uh, it might be why we're, at, you know, we're having such yeah. a serious crisis. Um, you mediated a talk uh, that took place here at USC with uh, former British Prime Minister David Cameron. Did he have um, anything that you found particularly insightful, of, um, any similarities between our current situation and um, the, the recent uh, times in, in Britain? Um, uh, well, he, he did, he did. Um, I can't tell you everything he said because some sure. of it was said in confidence and there are things he said in public. Um, what he said in confidence was actually really interesting, but I think one thing that he said which was really important that I can say is that we, a lot of people are voting with their guts and not actually mm -hmm. looking, for example, at the policies themselves. They're voting in some kind of irrational gut reaction. And that means that people who are going out into the political realm with you know, policy numbers and all this rational stuff yeah. are not necessarily going to get the response that they think. Right. And that was really insightful to me. <clears throat> and um, uh, that, you know, that was, that was an eye opener. Uh, he's an incredibly skilled politician. Whatever you think about him, whatever you think about Brexit, which mm -hmm. is a disaster, he's an incredibly skilled guy. Um, and right. for him to say that is quite interesting. Therefore, you know, things have changed and politicians need to be aware of that. Um, and I think that's how, you know, Trump snuck up on everybody, yeah. was just appealing to the gut and not right. trying to reason with people. That wasn't, that wasn't gonna work. <clears throat> Is there um, one piece of advice that you find yourself giving most often, whether it be to these foreign governments uh, or even to your students or anything like that? Um, a tidbit, whether it has to do with uh, history or writing or 
life in general? <laughs> I don't know if there's one that crosses all those things because, of course, I wouldn't ask myself of this. But to the <laughs> governments, I'm always saying, you know, be transparent. You know, sh there, you can't have democracy unless people understand what you're doing and trust uh, what you're doing. And therefore, you know, you need to teach them and show them, for example, how you're doing your finances. Right. Or they will think you're stealing the whole time or what you're doing is useless. Of course, they'll answer back, it's harder than you think, and I get that, but they usually use that as an excuse not to do anything right. about it. Um, you know, that's the advice that I give when I'm on the road to these governments. It gets resisted and resisted, and then you go to the place that they do it, and it worked so well. Um, <laughs> but for that, you know, politicians are going to have to have more spotlight on actually what they do, and I understand why they don't. It's really, mm -hmm. people are down on politicians, Right. There are lots of bad ones, but a lot of them are actually good and skilled. And you have to yeah. ask yourself, would you want to do that job? I mean, I work right. with major world politicians. I have no desire yeah. to be, have the spotlight yeah. and to do that all the time. It's hell. Yeah. Well, we're asking for more transparency here as well. Um, yeah. That is all the time we have here tonight. Uh, Professor Jacob Solf, thank you so right. much. Uh, you've been watching CU at USC. Tune in weekday nights at 6.30 p.m. Uh, thank you so much for, walk for watching and have a great evening. All right. Hi, I'm Lynn Swan, and you're watching Trojan Vision. Fight on.